just sort of dust was settling and I was laying against this rock and my dad just walked over and just went, what, what, what are you doing? And I rode back to the car park and that was it. We have come, or I have come, all the way up to Inch Perfect Trials in Clitheroe to meet the man, the legend, Dougie Lampkin. There's actually some quite exciting stuff you do in January, but before we get to that, I want to go back in your, I was going to say racing career, but normally when I do these it's for superbike riders. This is the first person I've done that's not a superbike rider. So, I think our careers started similarly in that our dads were both into the sport we did before. So how did you, how did it come about you becoming a trials rider? Yeah, I think uh, as you touched on there, it's down to family really. My family's always been involved in motorcycling. And uh, yeah, my father was world trial champion in 75. Um, I was born in 76. Uh, so I'm quite a bit older than you. I know that before somebody writes it. But yeah, no, I, um, I obviously followed my father in his early years. I don't remember that much of it, but it was sort of, I was never ever pushed to be on a motorbike, that's really, really clear, I sort of emphasised that, in fact I played more golf when I was 11 and 12 year old than actually ride bikes, you know, back in the day you could do that, you didn't need to be born on it, but yeah, it was sort of destiny that I was always going to be bikes involved when my father rode for Bull Taco at the time, when my mum announced that she was pregnant and they gifted her uh, Bull Taco Chispa 50cc, so effectively my parents had a motorbike before I arrived, so yeah, there were certainly going to be wheels involved. Yeah. Is that similar for you? Well, that's funny because um, the same for me and my brother. Neither of us were into we rode bikes when we were kids, but we didn't. I didn't start racing until I was twelve. Uh, Taz didn't start till he was ten because he just sort of copied what older brother did. Um, and yeah, we were the same. We were never forced into it. We used to play football and everything else. Well, that's interesting there. Just because my sons are riding now, and Alfie's just turned seventeen. He did the world and the European Championship during this year. Before Covid they rode a little bit, but yeah. more messed about, knocked about with their friends, did a little bit of riding when I was riding locally or just practice on weekends off. And now they want to do it. One's doing trials, Alfie's doing trials, Fraser's 14, who's extreme enduro, so yeah, I thought I was retiring, but I'm See, busier than ever now, chasing kids. But that's what, and I wonder, do because I think in a way it was a blessing that we started later because we didn't get sick of it. I've seen a lot of kids now that are forced onto bikes when they're three, four years old, and by the time they're 16, 17, they're already burnt out and they've done... But at the same time, I don't know if it's actually possible. I think you have to start at a certain age. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting subject that because, um, obviously, like you said before, you're, you're all on racing. We're, we're the only sport that has nothing to do with racing, so we're trials and in our own little world. I mean, I grew up with my cousins, Dan and Ben Hemingway. We literally were inseparable when we were kids. And Dan's kids, Harry and George, um, both European champions in their relevant classes. Harry's world junior champion. Um, they did start really, really young. Their level is absolutely fantastic. Um, but they do absolutely love it. But mm. yeah, you do see it sometimes. But I think you saw it more, I say, back in our day. Yeah where people got tired of it now i think you do have to start young really yeah you know it is part of it it's there's it seems a lot more serious it seems i'm not going to say more professional because i still don't think anyone really rides as much as what i did um when i was sort of coming to the top and staying at the top but yeah it's a it's an interesting debate is the shove them on early yeah. or let them mess about and shove them on when they're 10, 11, 12 or whatever. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's a right or a wrong way and like you say you do see some sort of horrors. We don't really have that in the trials I think more of the sort Mark of situations. Mm, yeah. motocross world sort yeah. of a thing of you know parents fighting on the start line and waving gloves if you pass that rider and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. We don't touch wood. We don't really have that. And you touched on this earlier, this was a question I wanted to ask, because in road racing it's actually quite difficult to practice our sport because you've got to go on a track day, it's expensive, you've got to put tyres and fuel in a, in a bike, um, and some years in my racing career I've only ever ridden two or three times outside of the actual races because there wasn't 
the option to go and ride. You said that you rode a lot. Did you just, or how often were you riding? Did you go to the gym? What did you do to <coughs> train? I used to go to the gym in the morning and then ride in the afternoon. Um, but as I sort of progressed and sort of switched from B to riding to Honda after a couple of world championships, I pretty much lived in Spain because the bikes were there. And if it wasn't an event on the weekend, I just ride every day except Monday. Really? Just wear a bit of a jokey thing with my test rider, I must build out that no bikes on Monday. <laughs> and it, 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 it just took forever, really, literally. I've got kids on it now as well, so at least we can <laughs> not ride at least one day. But now, like, take for example, Jaime Busto, he's been with Vertigo now for the last four years. He rides every day. And he's not allowed his bike at the weekends because he goes with his friends and jumps over the biggest gaps and does everything that he probably shouldn't do. Mm. And he has a separate bike for the weekend so that he can still ride on the weekend. So he will ride between five and seven days a week, every single week. And so then he'll go to the gym on the way home. And that's why they're still there. That's why your Adam Rag is still there at 40 years old. Tony Bell's still there at 35, 36 years old. Yeah. Because they're just putting in. There's no substitute for the hours. We are lucky where we can ride. And in Spain, you can ride so much more free to yeah. ride where you You just have to live in Catalonia if you want to make it. Yeah. It's coming that way in our sport as well a little bit that people are just moving to Spain because you can't ride here from October to March and you're missing out on six months every year of not being able yeah, to ride. Absolutely. Why do you think Tony Bow is, well, for people that don't know Charles Riding, is he 32 times world champion? Is he 32 or 34 now? It 30. changes that fast that I can't <laughs> keep up. He seems to get younger and he seems to get more titles and he's the nicest lad in the world which makes it even worse. It's not fair, is it? No. He, um, I always go back to when I was riding for Honda. We'd sort of developed the force rope, which was, to be kind to it, not a friendly machine in the beginning. Mm. But developing it was one of the finest moments of my career. You know, when you've got five or six HRC people bringing engines hand carry, when you could do that. Yeah. Obviously not now, every week. You know that you're part of something special. Yeah. And I was part of that. We just about got the bike good. I was just about to get the Don't Come Monday from Honda, which unfortunately, although it is the best place ever to ride in the world, you come in through the front door and they're waving at you and they kick you up out the backside to get out the back door, it doesn't matter what you are. Yeah. Colin Edwards told me that before I was leaving and I thought I was joking, but he wasn't, he was absolutely bang on. Um, and he came to test and he rode my spare bike and me and my teammate Takeshi Fujinami, a Japanese rider, was also being world champion. Uh, we couldn't ride this section and just then I thought oh the bike was too big for him because I'm, I'm taller than him and he was stretched and you back suspension you could tell it would work just right for him and I was thinking oh my god that's it and it's funny you just know then and it's just got better and I think really for the last sort of five or six years Adam Raggers just got his head round that seconds like winning yeah and he talks about it being his best two stroke and the other the four stroke. Tony could win on anything. Yeah. Some of the videos you see on the internet are just the Yeah, worst. and yeah, it's just amazing. He rides a lot less now. He doesn't do a Spanish championship. His level is absolutely unbelievable. Um, yeah, he's amazing to watch. Yeah. And, and then the next sort of part for me, which I've is like a new part of my uh, life and career is now I've stopped racing and I stopped quite early, 28 years old. I stopped because I just had, had enough basically, I just didn't want to do it anymore. When did the point come in your career where you wanted to not compete or what was the reason for it? <coughs> it was funny really, I think a, a big, I'm not going to say a kick but yeah probably a kick was when I, I think it was like 07, I, never, I always forget what years I rode for what bikes and stuff like that so. But I think it was like 07, I was getting the beginning of the year, you'll be here forever, you'll want you to be team manager, you know, Fuji's won last year, that's brilliant for us. And then literally in like June or July, I got the, you won't be getting a new contract offered in December. I was like, wow. And that's how quick it happened. I mean, it's not, it wasn't just because it's me, but that is Honda. That was a big kick. I went back to Beta, which is where it all began. Obviously my cousin John's been the importer for forever, it seems, since the sort of late 80s. So that felt like going home. I was still riding well. I was finishing sort of sixth, seventh, eighth. Not struggling, but not. it's not the same. Mm. And it was definitely wavering a little bit. And then that's when Raga was desperate to get back his title back off. 
Bolo just started winning. And he asked me one day if I'd consider going to Gas Gas and being team manager and developing the bike and stuff like that. And I really fancied it. And the owners at the time and the people in charge were just so enthusiastic about having me. It was like somebody giving me a cuddle and putting their arm around saying, oh, we've got a bit of a challenge for you. And I loved it. Yeah. And he lost the title twice, both times on the last day, once on the last lap. And I made a bit of a technical problem. And, and he should have probably beaten Tony that year. And I, I really enjoyed that and I really enjoyed the developing side of it. And I was sort of done then. And I was riding, I had a big problem with my ankle. I had a massive crash in Spain, rolled down the hillside. A bike would hammer me all the way down. And I was just sort of, dust was settling and I was laid against this rock and my dad just walked over and just went, what, what, what are you doing? And I rode back to the car park and that was it. Really? Yeah. And then I came back for one of the last rounds because my dad and my manager, Jake Miller, I've been with since the late nineties. Um, they were running a trial in Fort William, a world championship. So I decided to ride and, and sign off there and then, which I think I just sort of rode round. I didn't. It didn't really happen. Yeah, it wasn't a great day, but yeah, I've been really lucky because new stuff has sort of cropped up. And then a man wanted to, who I've known for a lot of years wanted to build his own bike, and I tried to talk him out of it for a few years. And then he was like, "Well, I'm building it, so it's up to you." So I was like, "I'm having a bit of that," and I joined that. And that's the sort of time when Red Bull got me doing some different events like yeah. uh, Erzberg Rodeo and Extreme Enduro was just coming in. So I was doing. A few of those events and things started rolling again and I was like oh now you're doing extreme enduro a bit of trials team managing developing and I just sit, seemed to just get to the stage where it was like this could be it and I had another door opened yeah and that has sort of kept going which has been absolutely brilliant you know the opportunities that I've done and projects with Red Bull are you know as good as my world championships effectively yeah. And then in COVID, I, my wife, I, I told her finally, that's it, I was retiring. And then the kids started riding, so guess what? It's like <laughs> double doors have opened Go, now. Yeah. I've got Enjoy one weekend, trials another, wife going one direction, me the other. Yeah, it's flat out, but yeah. basically I've been trying to retire for a few years, but I can't stop can't. riding my bike. Just, and you touched on it then, was your Red Bull project. So the one that's blew my mind, <clears> I remember <throat> watching it live, was your wheelie around the other man. So just let's talk about that and how that came about. <clears throat> yeah, well, the, th the great thing about with Red Bull and the projects is they are your idea. They don't come knocking on your door going, they're yeah. just like, what do you fancy doing? And there's a lot of stuff that I've wanted to do that haven't happened. And the wheelie had started going round. I was like, back to basics. When you're a kid, you either want a wheelie a bike or you want to jump it. Mm. And there's no way I'm jumping a trials bike anywhere. So I don't fly very well. <laughs> So I thought, well, there we are, wheelies. And my idea was that we'd be, I'd be following a van around Cadwell Park, seeing if we could get round. And that was genuinely that. And then we got invited back down to London to the office with Jake, and they were like, you know, we're thinking a bit bigger. What? And then I said, well, you used to live in the Isle of Man, you know, the TT lap's amazing, but you, you know, you could never get, and they were just like, ooh, 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 ooh hang on a minute, TT, how far is it, 37.7? And Jake, I could see Jake looking across at me like, oh my God, what's he on about? And it snowballed. And I remember going home uh, and my dad was at home and he went, I told him what was going on and he was like, well, how are you going to do that? You can't wheel it to the end of my drive. And that's like 500 metres. And, and he was right. So, <clears throat> and then it still started escalating because it's always been talked about by another drinks company that you can't film live at the TT. Yeah because of the undulation, because of everything, just because of the technical sort of difficulties in making that happen. Well, that was like, thinking of live, I was like, <laughs> wow, wow, yeah, why, live, one it wonder, that's it. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was it. And then obviously dad passed away. Well, the go ahead in like February, dad passed away in like the April, June, I couldn't wheelie. I was doing 1.2 miles. I was screenshotting my Strava because we had a private Strava on and sending it to everybody saying, I need out, yeah. I, can't, I can't do it. And that didn't, we were a bit too far in for that. <clears throat> there was already permission for masks and helicopters and all sorts of stuff for the lives. So yeah, sort of a game changer. I started with the front wheel spinning on the bike 
and then had an emergency dash to Cadwell. I had two hours round Cadwell and, and I weaved a few laps without touching the front wheel. I drove home like a new man. I was like, we've got a chance. Can do it. But I only wheeled distance twice and they were both at Croft before I actually went and did it. So Bonkers. it was... And you modified the bike, didn't you? The, what did you have to do to the bike? Yeah, well, back in the day, um, Dave Taylor, who's also sadly passed away, he tried three times to do it. And we had his family involved and they were great. Um, and they actually came to the event and watched me do it. Um, and, you know, like they said, you know, it was his dream to do it. He never managed it, but, mm. you know, really pleased that I'd sort of taken it on. And we were looking at his bikes and he had front wheel spinning. And that was a game changer. Really? That's when it all started to happen. But that was from him and also stood on the back. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, I've seen it all, you know, it also for what it is. It's like a segue, a piece of cake. Well, we had all the press, a couple from Europe, MCN, TMX, everybody, and not one press person drove it, rode it more than about, I'm going to say 10 to 15 metres. Really? It's been polite, they just couldn't ride it. Yeah. And all my team have been trying, was trying to ride it after the event, and it was a joke. Yeah. I did over a thousand miles practicing on the damn thing. <laughs> I've never touched it since. Really? I drove up Chelsea Walsh Hill Climb just to set the record for the wheelie up there and that's the one and only time I've ridden it since. It's parked up in Red Bull office. <laughs> I'd never be started again. <laughs> I don't want to even see it. Well, that's a great achievement to have. So, they're absolutely amazing projects and I think that's sort of now led you into where you are now. Talk me through what's coming up for you in the next few months. Yeah, well, I've decided I didn't just have enough on. So I asked to uh, Jake that I wanted to sort of revive the indoor trial, um, which has not been run since 2019. Basically, back in 96, my dad and his friend Neil Crosswood set up doing uh, an indoor trial at Sheffield, which was hugely successful. And my dad missed the quite a f few of the last years. And Neil, unfortunately, he passed away and missed the last years. But uh, we, we all did it mm. with their family as well included for 25 years which was absolutely amazing and yeah we've missed it now and we haven't had a world round in and I was like we need to have Tell Me Bell when the big boy's back and it'd be great to do it and then coincidentally with that Sheffield Arena gave me a call saying look we're, we're back open and what about coming back and I sort of talked Jake into it a little bit really <laughs> I'm not going to say that it, it was in but yeah it's been nice to do I think partly from me because of what I've achieved and wanting to, you know, do something like that. And also a bit of a nod to my dad as well. Yeah. So, yeah, so my brother's uh, together with me and, and also Jake. And, yeah, we've got uh, first EL12 window on the 7th of January at Sheffield Arena. And, yeah, with a few people moving, it looks like it's going to be um, riders on new bikes. Um, we've got the all three world champions riding, so of each class. So, yeah, I'm really pleased, got the absolute best, so pressure's on me now to uh, make it good to watch. Yeah, well, that's exciting. I'll be, it's a good time of the year for me because I'm free and we can come up and watch with Dan and Taz. Uh, we are now at, we mentioned earlier, Inch Perfect Trials. Trials riding is not my forte, as we've touched on, but what I am going to do is take my camera out and pretend to ride and mainly film you looking impressive. So that's where we're going to go ahead now. You're selling yourself a bit short. No, man, I, right? <laughs> I've learned in life on road bikes, it's better to sell yourself short. <laughs> so yeah, we're I'm expecting now. big things. Watch this. <laughs> Come to the first section, <laughs> and I'm just not going to even try and embarrass myself because uh, I'm going away in two days, and it's going to be far more impressive watching Dougie. So uh, it's a struggle for me just even walking up like this. This is me just telling them I'm bailing out. <laughs> this is the warm up. I don't know if you realise, but you've forgotten your back. <laughs> Safety first, Dougie. Safety first. <laughs>
make it look so easy. This is what I hate about trials riding. <laughs> yeah. That's what everybody says. <laughs> I wish I'd filmed that the first time. I'm going back down to Dougie, he's just took me up uh, a brook or stream, which, uh, well, you can hear how much I'm breathing. I've got arm pump worse than I've had arm pump in I don't know how long, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. Just remembered how many trials riding skills I don't have. Uh, but yeah, I'll go back down now and film it again so you can have a laugh at me, because trials riding is not my forte. I don't know what is.